Hi, welcome to the JE Plugins channel, where we discuss audio DSP and apply methods to generate audio FX plugins. In this episode, we will be introducing the concept of virtual analog and digital modeling. Using the topics discussed in the last two episodes, an implementation of a Tube Screamer style audio effect will be demonstrated in Juice. On to today's video. Virtual analog is the process of using DSP techniques to approximate the perceptual effects of analog audio FX units. This is typically done by taking various measurements of a device and recreating the measured effects using DSP methods. This might be filtering, nonlinear processing, convolution or a combination of various effects at different stages. In more advanced virtual analog processing, methods of mathematically modeling physical phenomena or components can be developed which can sometimes result in more accurate results. We refer to this as digital modeling. In digital modeling, when we know the inner workings and components within the system we are trying to model, we refer to this as white box modeling. Nodal analysis and wave digital filter simulations are white box modeling methods of linear circuits. Wave digital filters have advanced in recent years and can now model nonlinear elements but in their basic form they are limited to linear elements such as resistors, capacitors and inductors. When we do not know the inner workings of the system we are trying to model, we refer to this as black box modeling. Convolution can be used to do this. However, machine learning has become more commonplace in black box modeling as it is able to produce more adaptable results. Sometimes, a combination of white and black box modeling methods can be used. This is referred to as gray box modeling. Now, onto the Tube Screamer. We will not be modeling the Tube Screamer with circuit modeling methods in today's audio plugin demonstration, as that is a relatively advanced topic. But we can take a look at the schematic and see what is going on throughout the system. We have multiple stages which are all of importance to the perceptual effects of the system. First, is the input buffer. In the input buffer, we can see that we have a capacitor and resistor in series and then another resistor that is parallel. This will provide high-pass filtering. We also have a transistor. This will have a subtle non-linear effect and amplify the signal when going into the next stage. Whenever we see elements which are made up of diodes, we have a non-linear effect and transistors are essentially two diodes facing in opposite directions. Operational amplifiers also add non-linearity as they are just a network of transistors which are in turn made up of diodes. The next stage is the clipping amplifier this is where the majority of the distortion effect is generated. Initially we can see we have another high pass filter. The clipping is generated in the bridge between the input and output of the op amp. We have two diodes, one for clipping the negative parts of the signal and one for the positive. You may assume that the clipping generated by this is symmetrical. This is mostly true. However, there is some discrepancy caused by the phase effects of the previous filters. More asymmetrical clipping can be achieved in guitar pedals by adding an additional diode in either direction. The amount of clipping achieved by this circuit is altered by adjusting the potentiometer at the top of the circuit. Let's briefly discuss how diode clipping works. A diode is the most basic semiconductor. What this means is that it only conducts electricity under certain conditions. In the case of most diodes, it will only begin allowing current to pass when the voltage across it is 0.7 volts or greater. However, this value can be different for different diodes. The diode will not just let current pass at 0.7 volts and block it before, either. The amount of current passing through the diode increases exponentially as the voltage approaches 0.7. However, the current before this is minimal. This subtle but noticeable curved transition is what causes soft clipping, but some diodes and clipping circuit arrangements do have harsher clipping than others. This figure demonstrates a simple clipping circuit. The signal will pass through the circuit when the signal is below 0.7 volts but when the signal is above 0.7 volts the signal passes through the diode instead and is lost in the output signal. This figure also shows biases to the diodes, which adjusts the voltage at which the clipping occurs. However, it is still 0.7 volts plus or minus the bias voltage. As the clipping is mostly symmetrical, we can approximate the clipping in the circuit using a sigmoid. In this example, the tan H function has been chosen. We will be using filters that will also have phase effects, so this should model the discrepancies in the clipping. The next stage is the tone filter. The output buffer has also been added here, 
and it is quite similar to the input buffer in its design. The tone stage is a variable low-pass filter, which is controlled by a potentiometer. The level control is also a potentiometer which will adjust the output voltage. This is then run into the output buffer, which has a high-pass filter both before and after the buffer transistor. Doing AC analysis in LT SPICE reveals the output frequency response of the system. In this simulation, the tone stage potentiometer has been stepped to reveal the frequency response at each potentiometer position. If you are interested in learning how to use LT SPICE for circuit analysis, then I highly recommend this tutorial series by Fesh Electronics. Based on the simulation results, we will apply a high pass filter on the input stage of the plugin. A biquad filter with a cutoff of 300 Hz and a quality factor of 0.5 has been chosen. Using the biquad calculator developed by Nigel Redman, we can quickly plot the frequency and phase response of the filter. For the tone stage, a biquad low pass filter has been chosen. This time the frequency cutoff will be adjusted between 1 kHz and 6 kHz based on the position of the tone parameter in the plugin. Here are the plots for the minimum and maximum of the filter bounds. Now, let's see how this effect has been implemented in Juice. In our plugin we have two CPP files and two header files. One of each for the plugin processor, which contains the DSP elements of the plugin, and one of each for our biquad filter which was introduced in the last episode. Do not worry if you do not understand all the code in this walkthrough, you will understand everything better the more you are exposed to it. Our plugin processor header file contains the declarations of all the functions used by the plugin. Everything in the public section is generated by Juice. We add our own variables and methods at the beginning of the private section. Here, four biquad filters have been declared. As the objects are mono, we need two for each channel, and we have two filter stages. So the result is four biquads in total. Next we have declared our audio processor value tree state class, which is a juice class which will handle the parameter states. We also get our current parameter values from this class. We now have our member variables. Here we define the frequency cutoff for the input stage filter, and a gain compensation constant which will reduce the output gain applied by the distortion algorithm. Next we have some atomic pointer variables which we will use to store the parameter values from the value tree. We also have an audio parameter choice pointer which will store the current bypass parameter setting. Finally, we have three float and one ball variable which will store the final parameter values for use in the DSP processing. Below this, we have defined a linear mapping function which we will use to calculate the final parameter value based on each parameter position. This will be used to map the tone filter from 0 to 1, to our filter cutoff bound of 1 kHz and 6 kHz. A mild sigmoid function has also been defined. This will not be used to generate the main distortion effect, but will be applied before and after the main distortion effect to mimic the non-linearity of the transistors and op-amps around the clipping amplifier. Finally, we have declared a getParameters function which will obtain the parameter values from the tree state and calculate their final values. This function is defined in the plugin processor CPP file. Moving over to our plugin processor constructor, you will see we have added a constructor for our audio processor value tree state. This is due to that class not having a default constructor. As the plugin is relatively simple with few parameters, we can add our parameters in the tree state constructor, like we see here. All of our float parameters are set within the bounds of 0 and 1. This will be the value exposed to the user. We also have an audio parameter choice, which will allow the user to bypass the processing within the plugin. In the plugin processor constructor we initialize all of the filters being used in the plugin. This will set the filter types for the relevant filters. Scrolling down we can find our prepare to play method. This is a juice method which is called before playback which we can use to reset any objects with a new sample rate or flush old audio data. Here we have reset each filter with the sample rate. Scrolling down further, we can find the definition of the getParameters method which was declared in the header file. Here we get the current parameter value from the tree state and save it to each pointer variable. We then calculate the final parameter value using the linear mapping function and save the variables to be used in the signal processing method. The bypass value is saved directly to the boolean variable. Finally, we can also set the cutoff of the tone filters here as the final value has been calculated. Now, we are finally at the method which will apply the audio effect. First, 
we get a right pointer to the channels which we will be using in our audio processing, one for the left and one for the right. We then call our getParameters function to calculate the current parameter values. We then use a for loop to loop through the samples of each buffer. Some plugins will use another for loop to cycle through the buffers. However, as we are handling the channels manually, we only need to iterate through the samples up to the size of a buffer. There are better ways of handling this but I find this method easier to understand for beginners. We use if statements to check whether the plugin is mono, mono stereo or stereo. The code for the mono stereo and stereo is mostly the same. However, the left sample is duplicated to the right channel and processed independently. Looking at the mono only code we can see the DSP logic of the plugin. First we retrieve the current sample from the buffer, then we save a copy to use if bypass is enabled. Next, we apply our input stage filter, and pass the filtered signal through our mild sigmoid function. We then apply the tan h clipping function to generate the main distortion effect using the saturation coefficient. The saturated signal is then processed with the tone filter and that filtered signal is passed through the mild sigmoid function again to model the output buffer transistor. This next line of code is a shorthand way of doing an if statement. The code will check whether the bypass is enabled, if it is, the output sample will be equal to the dry signal, if it's not, the output will be equal to the processed signal multiplied by the level control. We then save the output sample to the channel buffer. The logic for the other channel count cases is the same but also applied to the second channel. Finally, going down to the create editor method, we have changed the default generated plugin editor to a generic audio processor editor. This will mean we do not need to code a GUI for the plugin, a standard one which will show basic sliders and buttons will be generated. I find that this simplifies the plugin development process and allows beginners to focus on learning the DSP. This concludes the plugin walkthrough. Now, I will demonstrate how this plugin sounds. We can hear that the plugin effectively high pass filters the signal, and with no drive applied there is a mild crunch sound. This is a common use case for the Tube Screamer. The tone filter effectively adjusts the harshness of the output signal and allows for guitar tones of different styles. The level control also works as it should. Increasing the drive allows for high gain tones. Adjusting the level of the signal before going into the plugin also results in more crunch, which effectively mimics the subtle non-linearity of the buffer transistors. This concludes today's episode. A lot has been covered here, so I encourage you to download the plugin and experiment with the code. Go through each part bit by bit and see what each part of the plugin does. If you feel confident enough you can try making your own and using this as a reference. There are many other similar plugins out there that will do things differently, and the more code you look at, the better of an understanding you will develop over time. If you have any topic requests please leave them in the comments. Until next time.